Ever have a radiator that looks fine, but still can't keep the engine cool under load? It might not be the radiator itself. In this Motor Age Tech Tip, we're breaking down the thermodynamics of modern cooling systems and how to identify the real reasons radiators fail to do their job. This Motor Age Tech Tip is brought to you by B Pro Auto. Before you load up the parts shotgun and just start gunning parts at a cooling issue, you need to understand what a radiator actually does, and just as important, what it doesn't do. A radiator is a heat exchanger. That means its job is to take thermal energy from the engine coolant and transfer it to the air passing through the fins. That's it. No magic, no active cooling inside the core, just physics at work. And it's governed by a few critical principles of thermodynamics. First, heat transfer requires a gradient, often referred to as delta T. The radiator only works if there's a temperature differential between the coolant and the outside air. The greater the difference, the more heat that can be transferred. On hot days or at low vehicle speeds, that temperature gradient narrows, reducing efficiency. So say the coolant is 220 degrees Fahrenheit and the ambient air is 90 degrees Fahrenheit, your delta T is 130 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's a lot of potential. But if the airflow slows or the ambient temperature raises to, say, 105 degrees, that gradient shrinks and the cooling drops off fast. Second, surface area and design matters. Radiators cool by exposing large surface areas of coolant carrying tubes to airflow. So the more rows or cores equal more cooling if airflow and coolant flow are sufficient. But if the fins are clogged or the radiator is oversized with not enough fan capacity, efficiency plummets. Third, airflow must be unobstructed and directed. Radiator performance depends on steady laminar airflow. So anything disrupting that, dirty condenser coils, black shrouds, missing air dams, will reduce heat transfer. And lastly, coolant flow affects dwell time. So if coolant flows too slowly, it absorbs more heat but may not release it efficiently. Adversely, if it flows too fast, it may not transfer enough heat to the radiator before recirculating. Remember, it's a balancing act. Coolant must flow at a rate that lets it pick up heat in the block and lose heat in the radiator. Both require optimization, not just a, it's a good enough approach. This is where experience meets physics. When a radiator fails to cool, it's rarely the part itself. Remember, it's a thermodynamic process that has been compromised. And as pros, it's our job to trace which part of the process is broken. Now that we've established how radiator cooling is all about transferring heat through fluid flow and airflow, it's time to talk about real world things that disrupt that process, even when the radiator itself is brand new or appears visually fine. These hidden enemies of coolant efficiency can originate from either the air side, the coolant flow side, or from system design or contamination. Let's break it down. First off, there's stack core contamination. Most modern vehicles have a stack cooling package, a radiator, an AC condenser, and sometimes things like a transmission cooler or intercooler. Debris like leaves, plastic bags, or road grime can build up in between the cores where it's not visible without disassembly. This restricts airflow and insulates the radiator from the airstream. Second, there's bent or flattened fins. Even a few rows of crushed fins from careless pressure washing or an impact can kill efficiency. And then thirdly, there's active drill shutters that malfunction. So stuck closed shutters preventing airflow at speed, causing overheating even on the highway. And then lastly, inadequate fan operation. Weak fans, failed relays, blown fuses, or PWM module faults can cause poor airflow at idle or in stop and go driving. Many systems rely on variable speed fans, which may appear to spin, but still underperform. And don't just check if the fan spins. Verify RPM, current draw, and control signals if you're chasing an idle overheat. Coolant flow will also have a determining factor in radiator performance. So let's look at some factors that can affect the flow of coolant. First off, there's thermostat malfunctions. A thermostat that opens too late or too slowly can restrict the flow during rising engine load. Some electronically controlled stats rely on PCM control and can fail without setting a DTC. Then there's water pump issues. Worn or corroded impellers, especially plastic bladed pumps, can reduce cooling circulation. 
And don't forget, slipping belt-driven pumps or faulty drive pulleys can also reduce pump RPM. And then also, let's not overlook air pockets in the system. Incomplete bleeding or trapped air in the cylinder head or radiator drastically reduces the flow and localized cooling. And let's not forget head gasket or combustion gas intrusion because air or combustion bubbles introduced into the system can reduce heat transfer and even create vapor lock scenarios in localized areas. Internal restrictions in the radiator itself are also a killer of efficiency. So mineral or gel-based scale buildup from improper coolant mixture, for example, using hard tap water or incompatible types, create internal insulation on tube walls, reducing heat exchange. Also, the use of stop leak and sealant residue. Aftermarket sealants can clause the smallest passages in aluminum radiator cores. And then lastly, partial blockage from previous failures is always a concern. So sludge, oil contamination, and other droplets can choke out flow in specific zones of the core. And then here's a tip. If your outlet tank is significantly cooler than expected or shows irregular surface temps, suspect a restriction, especially if the system has had a history of overheating or sealant use. Radiators rarely fail in isolation. When they don't cool, the root cause is often upstream or downstream. Airflow problems, coolant flow interruptions, or contamination. That's why successful diagnostics come from understanding the entire thermal ecosystem, not just the part in the front of the grill. Even with a clean radiator, good coolant flow, and strong fans, you might still run into overheat complaints. But why? Because coolant efficiency isn't just about the hardware. It's about the conditions the system is operating under. Heat load and ambient environment play a massive role in whether a radiator can do its job. And with modern engines pushing higher output from smaller displacement, there's less margin for error. OEM cooling systems are engineered with a balance between weight, cost, aerodynamics, and expected use cases. Under normal load conditions, the system may function perfectly, but add things like a trailer or drive in 100 plus degree weather, climb a grade at low speed with the AC blasting, and the system may hit or exceed its design thermal limits. Remember, as I keep repeating, radiators are not working alone. They're sharing space and airflow with things like AC condensers, transmission coolers, and turbo intercoolers. All these dump heat into the same airstream that the radiator relies on. So when your AC system is fully loaded in 95 degree Fahrenheit ambient temps, your condenser may be preheating the airflow hitting the radiator by anywhere between 20 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Keep in mind that low speed and stop and go driving are worst case scenarios. At highway speeds, airflow is mostly ram air. It's more efficient and consistent. At idle or in traffic, you rely entirely on the fans and their control logic. Engine load may still be high with your AC on, city towing, long idle, and ambient air temperatures under the hood can climb rapidly due to recirculating hot air. Overheats that happen in traffic, but not at speed, that's a textbook indicator of insufficient airflow, not necessarily a bad radiator. And lastly, altitude, humidity, and fuel type play a role too. Thinner air reduces heat transfer capability. Moist air holds heat differently, reducing effective delta T, and ethanol blends or forced induction increase combustion temperatures, further taxing the system. Don't underestimate the environment. Cooling complaints can often be resolved not with new parts, but by understanding and adjusting for how load and airflow conditions impact radiator performance. Sometimes the system isn't failing, it's just maxed out. At this point, you understand how radiator performance is linked to airflow, coolant flow, and operating conditions. But when a vehicle is overheating or running hot, how do you pinpoint what's not working? That's where you take a thermodynamics diagnostic approach, using data, temperature mapping, and flow logic to isolate the fault with precision. Start with live data on a scan tool. It tells a story. Use your scan tool to monitor things like ECT. Track how fast it rises under load, during idle, or while cruising. Also look at fan control percentage versus fan speed RPM. Does the PCM think it's calling for more airflow? Is the fan responding? Also, the thermostat command and behavior, especially important on electronically controlled T-stats. And then lastly, IAT, or intake air temp, and ambient temp. 
This helps calculate available delta T. Compare ECT behavior during highway cruise versus low speed idle. Overheating at idle but not at cruise? Well, this can equal airflow issues. Overheating at cruise can equal possible flow restrictions or insufficient radiator capacity. You're gonna to wanna to use things like infrared thermometers or thermal imaging to measure items like inlet tank versus outlet tank temperatures. So a healthy radiator should show about a 20 to 40 degree drop depending on conditions. Also look at surface temps across the core. Cold zones may indicate internal blockage or poor coolant distribution. If an inlet is 215 degrees and the outlet is 190 degrees, you get a drop of 25 degrees. That's solid. But if you're only seeing a five to 10 degree difference, the radiator isn't working efficiently. And now you need to ask why. Next, confirm coolant flow. You can use an electronic stethoscope to verify water pump operation. Also check the heater core output with the heater on max. Poor flow here may reflect restrictions elsewhere. And try to vacuum fill the system to confirm no air pockets or vapor lock. Then check fan performance objectively. Don't just eyeball, measure current draw, duty cycle, or use a scan tool that displays fan percentage. Confirm fan ramps up appropriately with rising temps and AC engagement, and also visually inspect the shroud integrity and ensure airflow is directed through and not around the radiator. Remember, we want to evaluate the system, not the part. So ask yourself, is the radiator undersized for the current load? Is there a restriction to coolant flow or airflow? And is the engine creating more heat than the system can reject? If the stock radiator is being asked to manage aftermarket horsepower, towing loads, or high ambient heat in city traffic, it might not be the part that's failing, but the use case has changed. As you see, cooling system complaints are rarely about just one failed part. They're about an entire thermal management process breaking down. As we've seen, a radiator that doesn't cool might be dealing with poor airflow, restricted coolant flow, environmental overload, or simply system misapplication. That's why accurate diagnostics demand a thermodynamic mindset, not guesswork. If you're replacing a radiator, make sure it's up to the task, both with the vehicle and the conditions it'll face. Quality construction and fitment matter. That's where B-Pro Auto radiators come in. They offer OE matching performance and precision fit with the durability you can count on. You can find more information on them at bproautoparts.com. I'm Eric Screeden with Endeavor Business Media, and I want to thank the folks at BPro Auto for sponsoring this tech tip. As always, thank you for watching. <laughs>